All right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are particularly excited because it is February, and February for us means that we kick out all the men and spend the entire month showcasing incredible women from around the globe, uh, over 50 sessions from I think 20 countries this month, which is crazy. So really unique people from really unique places and thank you so much for being a part of our special festivities. Right now we are joined by six classes from across North America. So I'm gonna give them a chance to say hi before we dive in with our speaker. So we have Miss Dodson's K through eight in Salem, Massachusetts. Welcome in guys. Hey, hi, welcome. Hi, hi, hi. Awesome. We have Miss Anovich's grade nines in Brantford, Ontario. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. Hey. <laughs> we have Miss Maxwell's grade sixes in DeWitt in Michigan. Hi, guys. Hi. Welcome in. All right. We've got Miss Huxley's grade fives in Brampton, Ontario. Hi. Hi. Oh, hi. Hey, there we are. Uh, Miss Delgado's grade 12s in Homestead in Florida. Welcome in. Hi. What's up? Hey. Uh, this is like our third grade 12 class today in three sessions, which has literally never happened in the history of exploring by the senior fans. So that's exciting. Glad we're appealing to high schoolers. And last but not least, we are in Anchorage, Alaska with Miss Carton's grade four or five classes. Welcome in, guys. Let me just demute your mic and say hi. It doesn't want to demute, so we'll just wave. Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined for the first time ever in Italy, in Venice, Italy, lovely Venice, Italy, by Zoe Buratinsky. So she got the chance to sail around the world. While most of us were maybe going on little day trips when we were kids, Zoe did a little bit more of an adventurous journey. So today she's going to share about her experiences doing that, all the countries she got to see, the epic scale of it, and maybe a little bit about why she's in Venice today too. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Zoe, and take it away. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here and to share my stories with you. So I have a presentation or a slideshow. I'm just going to pop up here really quickly and then we can get started. Okay. I will let you know when it fills the screen. Okay. Here we go. Perfect. Good to go? All right. So I grew up in the countryside in Canada with my brother, sister, and parents. And before the age of 10, my life probably looked a lot like yours. I got up every morning and I went to school. After school, sometimes I got to spend time with my friends who lived nearby, or I played in the backyard and I built forts. There's one big thing that sticks out as not very normal. And that was the big 47 foot sailboat that was parked in our driveway from when I was seven years old until 10. My parents would always talk about the boat and it annoyed me so much. I remember getting mad at my dad and telling him that the word boat was a bad word and I didn't want to hear it anymore. I just wanted to spend time with my family. I knew my parents were very busy, but I didn't fully understand what they meant when they said we were going to sail around the world. Then, when I was 10, we packed up all our things and moved on to the boat. Imagine all the things in your room being packed up, and instead of moving into another house and putting your things into a new room, you get to move all your things into the little space of a boat. To us, the boat became our new home. Below decks, we had the main cabin with a little kitchen, a navigation station where all the paper charts, computers, and the radios for contacting other boats were kept. We had a table to eat our dinner at and a small bathroom. Everyone had their own little bed called a berth. Our berths were really small, maybe only two and a, feet half, two and a half feet wide, and they were right along the side of the boat, meaning that we got to fall asleep to the sound of the water lapping against the hull and the movement of the boat as we floated at anchor. On the boat, we had a screen so we could watch DVDs, but we didn't have any TV and most of the time we didn't have any Wi-Fi either. That meant that if we wanted to watch something, we would have to choose from our limited selection of DVDs because we didn't have Netflix or YouTube. The magical thing about living on a boat is that we moved our entire home as we traveled the world. That meant 
Though when we were below decks inside of the boat, everything looked the same. All of our things were there and we had the comfort of our surroundings. But because we would move every couple of days or weeks, our view outside was always changing. It meant that quite often we could emerge on deck and be greeted by a very different view than perhaps the week before. Sometimes we were in places that were low to the water and all we could see were palm trees and beaches. And other times we found ourselves anchored off of mountainous islands, huge capital cities, and sometimes even deserts. Because we were always moving, we couldn't go to normal school. So my parents homeschooled us. That meant that every morning we had to get out our school books and do the work that our parents told us to do. Sometimes we had to do school seven days a week because at other times there was so much to explore and so much to do that we would be too busy to do school. So when we had extra time, we worked really hard to get ahead so that we could take time off and go on adventures. Like when we were in Tahiti, which is a small island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. One day, my parents were sitting in the cockpit looking out over the back of the boat and they looked at each other and wondered if we could climb up to the top of this mountain. They decided that it was a good adventure and did some research to find out that there was a small cabin at the top of the mountain. Next thing you know, my siblings and I are pack, back, packing our backpacks for an overnight mountain adventure. We started at the base of the mountain and began hiking up. It was so steep that at times we had to climb up using ropes and ladders. There were huge plants along the side of the trail and sometimes the trees would drop away and we got to see a view of the mountain ridges around us. At times during the hike, it was a little scary because we were walking along ridges with steep cliffs on either side so that if any of us took a wrong step, we would go tumbling down into the deep ravines below. It took us hours and hours to climb all the way to the top. And we were so tired because on the boat, we didn't get to walk very often. So our legs weren't used to it. We had what we like to call boat legs. So by the time we got to the top, we were super sore. The mountain was so tall that when we got to our cabin, we found it engulfed in clouds. And as they floated by, we would get clear spots to see the amazing view around us. We could see the capital city of Papiete below us and also the other island across the water. We had an amazing view of the ocean that would go for miles and miles as we set up our sleeping bags, we started a little fire to heat up our cans of beans as, that we'd brought for dinner. We watched the sun set over the ocean and the lights of the city flicker on below us. We slept the night and the next morning we walked back down the mountain and returned to the boat to get ready to sail to the next place. As we traveled, we got to have lots of adventures and explore many cool places like hiking up the ridges of Tahiti but we also had to do chores like laundry. When you, live on a when you live on land, laundry is a chore, but when you live on a boat, it sometimes could become the adventure of the day. On the boat, all the fresh water we had aboard was in water tanks that were only a thousand liters in total. And that's all we had for five people to drink, cook, shower and live. So we were always limited with fresh water. Growing up, my mom always used to shout at us that we were using too much water and to turn off the tap because water was so precious. This meant that if we could do laundry on land, it could save us a lot of water. So when we were living anchored off of a small village in Madagascar, we decided to take advantage of the town's communal water well. So we collected all our laundry and motored to shore in the dinghy and then dragged it to the center of the village where we found a concrete platform with the water source. While the thought of spending the morning doing laundry was not very appealing, the fact that we were getting to do it with friends from other boats and in amongst the locals of the village made it worth it. As we worked away, a little toddler wobbled by and my sister and I took a break to play in the leaves with him. And a little later on, an old lady stopped by, kneeling down and taking a shower right next to us. It was amazing how this chore of laundry became an experience as we got to have a little peek into village life in Madagascar. <clears throat> For most of the time that we lived on the boat, my parents homeschooled us. 
But when I was 12, my parents thought it would be a cool idea to put my siblings and me into a local school so that we could learn French. They asked us what we thought and we agreed it would be a cool experience. Going to school from a boat is slightly different than going to school while living in a house. Usually while we lived on the boat, we were at anchor, meaning that our boat was surrounded by water. And if we wanted to go to shore, we had to use the dinghy, which was like our car, and it would take us from the boat into land. Every morning to get to school, we had to get into the dinghy and take it to shore. My brother and sister would then walk to their primary school and I would take the local bus or get a ride with my friends to my middle school. School was hard because it was so different from everything we were used to. The school system there was adapted to island culture and everything was in French, meaning that at first I couldn't understand anything. I didn't understand what my teachers were saying and I didn't know how to ask them what was going on. I couldn't understand my schoolmates, which made making friends and getting to know my surroundings very difficult. But after a few months, this began to change. I started understanding my teachers and being able to speak as well, answering people's questions and contributing to conversations. By the end of our 11 months there, I was able to understand all the lessons and I was able to speak French. It showed me that with some hard work, it's possible to learn new skills and adapt to new environments. After school finished, it was time to say goodbye and sail onwards, knowing that we would probably never return. By sailing onwards, sometimes this meant that we would be sailing for a couple of hours to the next island. And at other times, it meant that we would be saying goodbye to the sight of land for days or weeks. At sea, we were always surrounded by water and sky. And when we were on passage, we never stopped, meaning someone always had to be awake because we would sail through the night. The boat was always moving, rocking side to side as we sailed. Sometimes it was like living on a roller coaster. Imagine trying to cook and eat and sleep as your entire home is constantly moving, throwing things to the floor and sometimes you as well. My dad used to call us geckos because we would hang onto the edges of our bed as we tried not to be flung from the mattress to the floor as we slept. But the ocean wasn't always rough, and sometimes it was really calm and peaceful as we sailed along. The ocean would stretch out around us and it would be all we could see for days and days. Sometimes we would get dolphins at the bow and if the conditions were good, we could go up and watch them swim by the front of the boat. But in order to do this, we would always have to wear a life jacket and a harness that attached us to the boat. My parents were always very careful with our safety because if we ever fell overboard while we were sailing, there was a very high chance that they would not be able to find us again. This was because we had all the sails, because when we had all the sails up, we were harnessing the power of the wind. And by turning around, all that power would throw the sails across the boat, and that could be really dangerous. So instead of turning around, we would have to take down the sails, which would take time, and then we could. And because the ocean is so big and full of swell, it wouldn't take very long for a head bobbing in the sea to get lost among the waves. Because of this, life jackets were mandatory above decks. And if we wanted to go to the bow, we had to make sure we were attached to the boat and moving very carefully. Sometimes when we went to the bow of the boat, we got to find little flying fish on the deck. These fish would jump out of the waves, expecting to skim across the surface of the water before landing into the next wave. But instead, some had the unfortunate luck of landing on our decks. There's this one really funny story when in the middle of the night, when my dad was on watch, standing behind the wheel and making sure the sails were good and that we were still on course, that to his shock, he was slapped across the face. He turned on his light and found a small fly, flopping flying fish at his feet. It was such a surprise because the last thing he expected at 3 a.m. while in the middle of the ocean was to be slapped across the face by a fish. Living on a boat, we had a very loose schedule and we got to decide how long we stayed in a place and when we wanted to leave. 
However, because of the risk of hurricanes, we always had to make sure we were in certain areas of the world by certain seasons to minimize the risk that we would get caught in a storm. With this loose schedule, sometimes we would spend months living in one place, and other times we would only spend a couple of days. Sometimes we lived in very remote areas like islands in the middle of the ocean that only had a few small villages and an abundance of nature. And other times we would live in cities surrounded by people and the bustle of city life. When we were in cities, there was a lot to do. We would explore, eat local food, meet people and have experiences. We would also have to do boat maintenance and repair to ensure the boat was in working order for the sail to the next place. In addition, we would have to grocery shop, but not like you do when you live on land. On land, it's normal to buy groceries for only a couple of days, maybe a week. But on the boat, we would have to buy months worth of groceries for when we were sailing at sea or living in remote and uninhabited places. We called this kind of shopping provisioning. And when it was time to provision, the whole family would go to the grocery store. Now, we were always in different places, so the grocery store would change as well as the type of products we could buy. It was always a mystery what types of food we would be able to bring home. When we got to the grocery store, quite often we would get not one, but three grocery carts and the process would begin. My mom would have her list of all the food we needed and how much and she would tell us and we would go get it. For example, she would tell me that we would need 15 cans of peaches and it would be my job to dash off into the store and get all 15 cans back to the cart. She would then tell me my next mission and I would run off again. The whole family would do this until all the carts were full and all the items on my mom's list were checked off. Sometimes it took more than one trip to accomplish this. The next step was carrying all the food back to the dinghy. We didn't have a car, so we would either have to carry it all by hand and walk or carry it onto a bus. Or if we were super lucky, we could take a taxi right back to the dinghy. Then we would dinghy it out to the boat, get it all aboard and down into the main cabin before the big final step, putting it all away. This process of filling up the boat with months worth of food Getting it home and stowing it all was a huge task, but also a very necessary one, because if we didn't, we wouldn't have the food while we were in remote areas. Like when we sailed to St. Helena, a very small island located in the South Atlantic Ocean, about a 12-day sail off the coast of Africa. This island was discovered by the Portuguese sailors in the early 1500s and became crucial to their navy as they would stop by the island after weeks at sea to restock their boat with fresh food and water. Because they could stop, it allowed their boats to explore further because their sailors weren't hungry or getting scurvy. At the time, no one else in the world knew about this island. So the Portuguese had a huge advantage and they made sure to keep the location a secret so that no other countries knew about it. By the time we sailed there in 2015, the island was ruled by the British. However, its remote location still made it very difficult to reach. At the time when we visited, the only way to get there was by boat. That meant that getting supplies to the island was quite difficult as the supply ship only sailed by every couple of weeks. This made food a very valuable commodity because getting fresh food to the island was so difficult. Because of this, we ate the food we had bought when we provisioned in South Africa. Our fresh fruits and vegetables were the first to go, but we had plenty of dried fruits, dried and canned goods to eat. But we didn't mind that our diet became more limited because in exchange, we were living off of an amazing island and got to have some really unique experiences. Our boat was anchored off of huge towering cliffs so that when we came on deck, we would emerge to see a huge rock wall behind the boat. Beneath us was some of the cleanest ocean waters. I remember going for a swim and seeing a couple of huge mahi-mahi fish swimming around under our boat. On shore, we took a car up into the mountains to visit Napoleon Bonaparte's house and grave. Napoleon was a French military general who was captured in Belgium in 1815 by the British. 
the British were afraid that he would escape imprisonment, and as a result, they sent him to St. Helena, whose remote location ensured that it would be impossible for him to escape where he lived. And this is where he lived out the rest of his life. We got to walk through his house and visit his grave, which was located deep in the lush mountains. After a couple of weeks, it was time to sail onwards from St. Helena. The day we left happened to be my 17th birthday and leaving was slightly nerve wracking because this was the beginning of one of our largest passages lasting 31 days. That meant that we would be sailing without the sight of land for an entire month. Imagine living in a small boat with nothing but the ocean around. No Wi-Fi, no phones, no TV. The only people to talk to are your family and the only things you can do have to be within the small space of a boat. We couldn't run, we couldn't swim, our lives became very rhythmic as we lived in tune with the cycle of the sun and the moon and the motion of the waves. Spending so much time at sea caused us to lose track of time as each day was so similar to the last that we couldn't tell them apart. We spent our time doing school, reading books, cooking, and daydreaming. At times it was really hard because you would just get stuck with your thoughts and you'd want to just run around and you couldn't get out of the boat. But at other times, it was beautiful, nothing but nature, and it really taught us how to appreciate it and how connected we are to it. And then, after this entire month at sea, we were all so excited to arrive in the Caribbean at the island of Guadeloupe and finally set foot on shore and begin to explore a new place. Through our experience, we met so many kind people who opened their homes and welcomed us into their culture and taught us about their world. And there's one thing I've come to realize, and that is no matter where in the world someone lives, how differently they look, what they believe, everyone is doing the same sort of thing. Whether we were in India or Indonesia, South Africa or New Zealand, we saw that people wake up every morning. They go to work or to school. Everyone has families, brothers and sisters and parents. Everyone cooks, everyone eats, everyone laughs, everyone dances. Everyone does the same thing. And I think that this is a really important thing to remember as we live in a world where presidents are building walls and countries are fighting amongst each other. These countries that we call our home are separating us from each other and making us forget that we're all human. We get caught up in these small differences rather than focusing on the commonalities we all have. No one is really all that different. And if we can remember that, we can begin to focus on the bigger issues like spreading equality and taking care of the health of our planet. Because these are the issues that everyone faces no matter where you come from. And as we, you and I are the generation that are about to inherit this world. I think we need to remember this so that we can stay focused on what really matters. Thank you so, so much, Zoe, for that. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, let's dive in with questions, guys. I'm sure you guys have a lot. We've got six live classes. We've got a bunch more watching on YouTube. If the YouTube groups want to let me know where they're joining from and what grade they are, I'd be happy to take a bunch of questions there as well. Uh, Zoe, if you want to come out of screen share so we can see you again when we do the Q&A, that would be great. Uh, but let's head to Miss Maxwell's class. Mm. If you want to kick us off with a question, come on up. Can you hear us? Yeah, we're great. Okay. All right, and we have a question quick. quick come on up. Right. The camera is right here. Do you still live on the boat? I do not live on the boat. Right now, I live in Venice, Italy, where I'm studying in school, in university. Yeah. Have you had the chance to go on any sailing trips in the meantime, like since you finished on, that, on this big one, or not? No, actually, from <laughs> what I can think of, no, I haven't been on a sailing trip. <laughs> that was it. Many years and it's done. That's it. Never again. Would you I can't wait to get back on a boat, though, so. There you go. In the future. Perfect. Great question to kick us off, guys. Uh, how about we go to Miss Huxley's group, if you guys want to come up? Uh, how many countries have you explored? Yeah. As of right now, I've explored 43 countries. 
Wow. But only 35 with my family. I've kind of taken up a little bit of traveling since then. <laughs> Outstanding. No, that we're, we're not surprised at all. Uh, just by comparison, by the way, in the whole world, there's, I think, 195 countries. So you're about uh, fifth done, 20% done, still a lot to explore. Uh, Miss Delgado's class, if you guys want to come up, go for it. Uh, yes, um, throughout your whole like expiration, what was your economic status like? Ec economic status, like how are you making money? How are you able to buy all the groceries? Yeah. Great question. So my parents, when we were growing up, they always worked really hard, saved all their money. And then when we were sailing, they didn't work and they used their retirement funds um, to sort of support us traveling. And then now that they're back home and with their jobs again, they're again trying to like save up for retirement because they went through a lot of that money. <laughs> I love how literally we've had, again, three sessions today. Every single time we have a grade 11 or 12 class, the first question is, how do you pay for this? How do you pay for this? <laughs> so thank you guys practical. for that. Practical. It's very practical. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ms. Curtin's group, if you guys want to come up, go for it. Uh, Jordan and Amy. They're coming. Take your time. No hurry. Nice sustainable development goals in your wall, by the way. Yeah. Go. Okay. We have a two part that are very related. And go. Did you ever go fishing? And then... What did you do with the um, fish that fell in the boat? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we did go fishing. Actually, that was my brother. He loved to fish. He would spend hours and hours fishing. He would make his own lures. He learned how to clean fish. My dad and him, they would go out in the dinghy and they would go trolling um, with lines behind the boat. And they'd also go spear fishing. And then in terms of the flying fish on our boat, we would usually just throw them back into the water because they were really little and we couldn't eat them. <laughs> so in uh, a book that would only probably appeal to the grade 12 class right now in terms of just age range, uh, but Contiki is one of the most fantastic expeditions ever taken, a raft across the entire Pacific Ocean. And they got so many flying fish on their raft that it served as like their principal diet when they were on the boat. <laughs> they just had the chance to eat them. So, and they got slapped in the face as well. I think it's a purposeful thing, this face slapping. We'll have to ask and find out. Uh, Ms. Dodson, if you guys want to come up, uh, go for it. How many different types of animals have you seen? Ooh. And my question, sorry, my question is, um, what's the most stark difference that you've noticed since being off the boat and what has that taught you? Yeah, that's a really deep question. Really good question. Um, <laughs> hmm. In terms of animals, I don't know exactly how many different types of animals, but we got to see some really cool things. We, when we were in Tonga, we got to swim with whales. And when we were in India, we got to go camel trekking. And in the middle of the Indian Ocean, where we were anchored at this one island, there would be these squids that would swim along the side of the boat. My brother, again, the fisherman, he would just sit and try and catch them and we would have squid for dinner. Um, mm. And then, oh, when we were in South Africa, we got to go to the game parks and see lions and zebras. So lots of many different animals. And the starkest, difference in terms of me personally it was very interesting going from sailing where we sort of made up our own schedule and life was always changing and different to being in school in high school that was a big adjustment and it was also very different making friends I think that was a huge learning curve because on the boat we would meet people and within a week not even a week, it would be within the same day. It'd be like, oh, hey, another boat kid. And we'd become best friends and spend two weeks together and then sail onwards and never see each other again. Whereas in school, it's like we had to learn how to slow down and make friends, not just in a day, that it takes weeks and weeks and years to develop friendships. And that was a big learning curve as well. Yeah, that's something that's literally never been mentioned ever in Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I'm really glad that that really unique take on it. I like that. <laughs> Um, let's head to Ms. Anovich's class and then we'll do a whole other round. We're ripping through these guys. This is great. My question is, um, what top five, what top five countries have you traveled to before? Ooh, top five, you're 43. Ooh, <laughs> no pressure. Top five. 
Well, when we used to sail, I my top three were India, Indonesia, and Madagascar. South Africa also pops up. And then as soon as we moved home, I was like, oh, I, I was itching to travel. So my answer was like, just take me anywhere. And then as of recently, I've fallen in love with Spain. I would love to live in Spain. I guess that's actually five. I hit five. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't have to think they're anymore. All okay. They're all good. No. <laughs> India, India and Indonesia get brought up a lot by a lot of people as being really unique and wonderful places in the world. So uh, I'm glad that came in too. Um, before I go to the next class, actually in your presentation, the very first slide you showed of you guys by like tropical islands, they're really unique and I'm curious where you were. So if you're, you can look through your presentation and find that out. But while you're doing that, um, I'm gonna go back to Ms. Maxwell's class uh, and see if you go, oh, I had to go. Okay, we'll go to Ms. Huxley's class. <laughs> Come on and check in with you guys. We, we have, two questions. Uh, Michael has one. Uh, at the very beginning, I noticed uh, that you had, you talked about wind power, but uh, the kids also noticed a solar array on your boat. How did you use the solar arrays? And Michael? And what was the most memorable experience on the boat? Okay, so in terms of the solar arrays or the solar panels, again, like the water where we only had water tanks, we also only had battery, um, battery banks as well because we weren't connected to the grid. So all the electricity we had on the boat, we had to get ourselves. So on the top of one of our masts, we had a wind generator. And then on the back of the boat, we had the solar panels. And then if it happened to be not very windy that day and cloudy, then we had a generator on the back of the boat that we would have to run to help fill up our battery um, banks. So then at night, if we wanted lights on, we could have power. And most memorable experience. No That's question. really hard. There's so many different experiences. Hmm. hmm. Ooh, I just trying to think, I'm trying to get one to just pop into my head as a memorable experience. I think. Um, I can't, I can't think of one on the spot. <laughs> I'm not really, right? Uh, trying to condense such a huge expedition, such a huge part of your life into one moment is difficult. Uh, if there's anything that you think of after the fact that really pops up, you can send it to us and we'll share it with the classes, okay? Sounds good. <laughs> Um, so yeah, let's head to Ms. Delgado's group. I also want to stress if there's, again, if there's any YouTube classes that want to type in questions, please do, don't be shy. Uh, but Ms. Delgado's group, come on back up. Uh, yeah, were, did you guys have specific locations where you guys were traveling to or were you just like going with the flow? Yeah. So it was a bit of both. We were very flexible in where we got to go. So like my parents just decided that we should hike up a mountain. They'd like hear about some island. And then it was like, oh, well, we'll just go there. But then also there's um, sort of a trail that most sailors follow to stay out of hurricane areas. So you want to be in the summertime. You want to be down sort of south in we went to New Zealand to sort of get out of hurricanes and then a year later we tried to be up in Malaysia Thailand area just because those are sort of safe zones in for big tropical storms so we had flexibility within the day-to-day -day, but overall we had to follow a pattern and then again the next year we had to get, be down in South Africa and that sort of we broke that rule of like being in certain areas a couple times like when we were in school just because it was a calmer year in terms of storms and my parents decided that we would risk it and there was a good sort of hidey hole we could pop into if a big storm came through. Very scientific term hidey hole is. Um, <laughs> um, let's head back to Anchorage. These are great questions guys, really detailed. I love it. Um, what was your favorite place to go when you were on the boat? Yeah. Yeah. What, what happened when natural, natural disasters hit? Um, I think I really love the cockpit. If I think back to the place I missed the most, it would be the cockpit 
because it's where our whole family would come together. We would eat meals together all the time there on passage. It was sort of like you could come up on deck and get a little bit of air, some space from the boat and you could see the horizon. Um, and just sort of, I miss sitting in the cockpit and being so close with nature because on the boat we were, we lived inside but also outside. So we were very connected all the time to nature. Um, so that was my favorite place and natural disasters. So we did hit a couple storms when we were at sea and that was pretty rough. And then there was the tsunami that took place in Japan. And we were on the boat during that time. And um, we were in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So we were very, very far away from it, but we weren't sure what was going to come through. So we ended up waking up sewer. My parents ended up, actually, I think they stayed up all night and got our boat ready. And then we went out to sea because when the water comes in, it would have sort of flooded the lagoon. So we got out to sea where it would have just been another swell that passed under a boat, which is what ended up happening because it wasn't very big by the time it, it came out and reached us where we were in the Pacific. But um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, all right, we'll take your last two, Ms. Dodson's class. If you guys want to come back up, go for it. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. So first, how do you think you would have been a different person if you had lived on land with Wi-Fi and consistent schooling? <laughs> and, and James has a question. Yeah. yeah, mine's kind of similar, but also could, uh, when answering that question, could you elaborate on like something that the experiences on the boat have given you that you don't think someone like growing up in a traditional environment and education could have or get? Yeah. Those are great questions. And I think sort of, to, I hope I can answer both sort of in one. And I think growing up the way I did, I got to live in so many different cultures and in so many different environments. And because I was a kid sort of learning my place in the world, I took all these little cultures and I made them part of me. So I don't know who I would be without this experience because who I am is the world. That sounds, that sounds sort of funny, but I've taken little bits of the world to make them myself. And yeah, um, I think if I'd grown up in consistent schooling, I would have less of that yeah. as part of me. I hope that the, answers your question. Oh, it's great. And one of the things we get from all people that, that you know we bring into the program when they explore the world is that you come back with such a different perspective of your home and how wonderful it is in many cases and how totally, uh, you know, Canada and the U.S. are really, really fantastic countries for the opportunities we have here, for the resources we have here. And so the class that we bring in, you know, if you get a chance to travel in your life, you get that different perspective and, and see beautiful parts of the world. So great. Um, we could talk all day about that topic, but we'll <laughs> wrap up with a question from Ms. Anovich's class instead. Come on up, guys. Do you want to end us off? Did you guys did you guys ever revisit any locations that you had previously gone to? Yeah. Ooh, that's a really good question. So most of the time we sailed on and never went back, but there were a few places where we ended up spending a little bit longer, like um the place we went to school for a year in french polynesia we would go to other islands and come back and then we lived in malaysia thailand area for a year so we would be hopping back and forth between familiar places and that was actually super special for us to be able to go back to a place that we knew because after years and years of every time having to discover something new as exciting as it is it's like oh okay now we have to go find where the grocery store and where to go find Wi-Fi. So coming back to a place that we knew before was always super comforting and nice in a very different way. Fantastic. Great question. I know I said that was the last one, but I lied a little bit. We just got a YouTube one. So Mr. Richardson's class uh, in Hoover, Alabama wanted to ask how big was the boat you lived on? They missed the beginning of the presentation, so they missed that bit. Oh, good question. Um, it was 47 feet. Yeah. I think that's Very roughly big. 14 meters. <laughs> Very good. Yes. <laughs> right on. Um, cool. That's not a very big boat. That's a tight space to live with your family for that long. Well, kudos to you. <laughs> um, Zoe, is there a last message you want to share with class about how they can get out there and explore things themselves if they don't have the opportunity to sail around the world or where they can find out more about your adventure? Where can we send classrooms? Um, 
So, <laughs> um, I would say get out and explore the world yeah. if you can. Plan trips. I know there's usually trips through schools. I totally support that. If you want to find out more about my adventures and the adventures my family and I have had, my mom wrote a blog the whole time we were sailing. So there's there's pages of stories. A couple years ago, I did a TED talk. So if you Google my name, that should come up as well. And um, and I can send along my email if any classrooms want to reach out with more questions. I'd be more than happy to. Absolutely. So for all the classes, I know yeah. we can never take all the questions that classrooms have in a 40 minute session. Um, but if you do have more questions, thanks for that, Zoe. And we really appreciate that. And then we'll happily share any more questions. So send them to me at the email. We'll pass them along. Um, what we do at the end of every session, I'm going to demute every class's microphone. And so boys and girls, if you guys could get ready to join me and saying a huge thank you to Zoe for joining us all the way from Venice today. You are all now muted. Go for it. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. We really appreciate you being here again. An incredible month highlighting amazing women in science from around the world. So please do keep tuning in throughout the rest of the month. Um, thank you so, so much for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day.